awesome. I get paid to learn all these amazing things, get in great shape. Otherwise, I'd been like a sloth on a beanbag watching some football, right? Like I'm doing now. I need to do another action film so I can get paid to get in shape. Yeah. <laughs> Dahmer. That was the first time where I, you know, I had to play somebody that existed, embody the person that existed, and not just, you know, making up a character, right? So there's limitations to, to that. Limitations are, are, are very helpful and help guide where you want to go uh, with what you need to do, right? All the other parts are very, very difficult because I <laughs> was discovering what he had done, what his, you know, what his life was like, you know, very quickly, and how do I embody that with, with truth, the hows and whys and what's that, that he is and does and thought and felt and those type of things. So I had to do like some work on my own to find, to be courageous enough. I mean, to be frank, something I had to do is like, you know, look at cross sections of humans and think of it like a playboy and try to find some sort of thing to that. It was being courageous enough physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, to, to, to do that, right? That allowed me the freedoms to find some sort of space of where that brain and spirit is in Jeffrey Dahmer, right? Because the guy, the guy is just, I'm not, I can't relate to the guy, but I had to find ways to, to do that. I saw this mannequin and I thought, thought maybe it'd be a challenge if I could sneak it out without anybody seeing it like a prank. So you, uh, you still have it? Yeah, but I'll return it and this will be over. Thank goodness I was actually playing somebody that did exist because it allowed me to then just focus on the limitations of how he held himself, how he spoke, how he walked and talked and, and all that sort of stuff. Why don't we just go downstairs, go to church, I'll be attentive to everyone's needs and I will return the mannequin and it'll be okay. It was pretty harrowing, to be honest with you. It was pretty crazy. I remember my dad saw the film when it came out and he couldn't even hug me afterwards. <laughs> and uh, so I'm like, okay, good. I guess I did a good job. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure. There's just a different entry point into the, the character. A lot of, if it wasn't somebody that existed, it would be the location and to determine, because we're all products of our environment. You know, if we talk about Jim from the town, that is a product of an environment of Charlestown and Boston, a thing that that guy doesn't exist, but you know, that you know, certainly formed and shaped who the character was because of those, that place. Um, if it was Jeffrey Dahmer, there's the limitations of the, the person that does exist that, that formed the uh, behavior of, of the character. Jim doesn't exist, but he does exist because there's a version of Jim out there. Oh, there's a thousand of them. Yeah, like all my friends from Boston are like, dude, I know this guy. Da, da, da. You know what I mean? It's the, they're all out there. The town. I have none of it, just fond memories of, of that, just from, from Ben and Ellswit and our, our DP, just the whole crew, everyone behind that is, is, a, is stellar at their job. And that's amazing already. You know, you're in a winning position. And then to you know, shoot a film that it's about this very specific kind of region in that region. If we would have shot that in Burbank, California, it would have been a hot mess. Right? But we were able to shoot that film based upon Charlestown, in Charlestown, right? With that community in Charlestown. It was a very specific area, you know? And Owen Burke being one of the guys from that area, right? And, and Ben was also like the Prince of Boston, you know, being kind of a famous guy. There's a lot of pride in that community for lots of things. But, that, you know, Ben being one of those. And I mean, it all, it all informed us to, to be the best of what we could be to help tell that story in that, in that area. Um, and it was awesome. We had just such great experiences. I and mean, that's where I learned the accent. That's where I learned the behavior. That's where I learned that there are five, 10, 1,500 guys just like Jim. I met versions or I just pulled cherry picked pieces from, from people and behaviors, you know, um, to find that guy. <clears throat> a guy's walking with two horses, right? One horse is carrying 100 pounds. The other one's got 50. Now the 100 pound horse falls over dead. So the guy's like, what the f takes a 100-pound sack, puts it on the 50-pound horse. And that 50-pound horse, he won't move. He won't take one step with another pound on his back. That's me. This is all I know. Yeah, I got to spend a lot of time with, with, with the boys. 
um, on and off camera, off camera especially, you know, to just to kind of yeah, be more familiar, make it easier for our jobs even. And it's also like a very Boston kind of quip, you know. Their sense of humor it can be very, you know, you demean somebody or a thing, you know. You can, you know it's, it's a different thing. It's a very specific thing. It's funny as shit to me. I love it. Um, a lot of people think I'm from that area. I'm like, no, I just went there to shoot that film. That's it. But uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a kinship to, to that area. I, I, I love it. I love it. I need your help. I can't tell you what it is. You can never ask me about it later, and we're going to hurt some people. Whose car are we going to take? The Hurt Locker. I had the opportunity to spend a year with, with EOD and did the, all the courses that they did to become EOD, and how to essentially build bombs and then render them safe. There's a whole like Santa's workshop that they have set up. And I, and I say Santa's workshop because it looks like just sort of like a bunch of elves making shit and then it's make their make bombs over here and then you go over here and learn how to render them safe, whether it's electrical or debt cord or you, know, you learn about all these things and then about bomb making signatures and all this stuff. And then you put on the suit and you know, there's a whole test you do a physical uh, test. Uh, you'll do it for like, you're only supposed to spend about like 15, 20 minutes in a suit, but you do it for like 30 minutes. And your job is to go, you know, do all the protocol and then you find the 155 and you grab it and, it you know, take out the deck cord and take the 155 back, which is, you know, about 75 pounds or a 100 pound bomb suit. It's 130 degrees and you do it. So you do all the physical part and a lot of people pass that. But now what you do after you finish that bit, you go into the classroom and go to a whiteboard and just do simple division, like, you know, seven into 49. And you're just like, mm, you have to kind of think about it for a minute, right? It, change, it changes sort of your capacity to, to think, right? Where your head's at, where your brain's at, because of all the stress. This is all preparation to understand that job, the stress, the physical stress and the mental stress, the emotional stress, all that sort of stuff. And then the mental toughness that comes out of that. Now you'd think these would be like badass soldiers. Most EOD are like, look like school teachers. Like what? I mean, they're all just like, look, it's pretty much, you know, like you're a school teacher. Well, for the most part. I mean, the guy that trained me was a big linebacker looking dude. <laughs> but, you know, he had the heart and the mind for just, you know, very sort of super, super, super smart. They're all very, very, very intelligent. So it's, it's a very interesting job to me, man. 20 meters to the right of the building. He's moving, he's moving, he's moving to the building. Follow him, you got him? Got him. He's down. Good night. Thanks for playing. There's an intensity of like, you know, what this really means, you're just waiting it out, right? It's just, it's, everything's like a chess game in that film. From, the, again, the signatures of bomb makers and what they use and how they do it. They pass notes back and forth between you know, EOD and then bomb makers, there's a communication that happens. F***ing fascinating to me that that happens, right? I'm gonna build this bomb and this motherfucker's gonna see the note and like, oh yeah, I got you on that one or you got me on this one, right? That happens, crazy. I mean, I don't think I ever felt like I was comfortable doing that in the sense of, that felt at peace. But I certainly felt the, my personal effects of being just my first time ever in the Middle East, just as like a white kid from Modesto, California, going and spending so much time over there in the Middle East and then coming back, so my version of the cereal aisle was going to a Starbucks. I was a bit kind of culture shocked when I got back to the States anyway. And all I could hear is this conversation these two girls are having about their cracked toenail polish. And I was like, F what the f And I went home and I didn't leave for like 30 days. Just because of just culture shock of like, there's nothing to do with, you know, movie or bombs or any of that stuff. But I had my own personal version of, of that and how I had to sort of process that, you know, and how I thought about things and what I was exposed to um, certainly shifted my thinking in a, in, in a very big way. Not that I, I've been through war, not that I'm a soldier, it's none of those things. It's just sort of my personal experience of like, you know, 
it was harrowing enough just what I did, just in a physical, spiritual way with the, you know, in shooting that thing, shooting that film, you know. Hawkeye. It's been a wonderful, wonderful, you know, blessing, first and foremost. Five amazing friends that we've all shared something very similar and been through a lot of things together, personally and cinematically, and um, we share so much together. That, that shared experience is where, where it's all at for me. That's a, it's a beautiful thing. And within the, the world, just, you know, when it gets the character and stuff, there's always, there's like limitations of like how to really kind of, you know, forward the character, understand the character more, because, you know, everyone's got a, a cog in the wheel to, to support the whole picture. There's been telling, you know, like in the Age of Ultron when Hawkeye had a family that no one knew about in this farm in the middle of nowhere, and that was very telling. I don't know if that was written because that's what my life is, because I was a single father and a thing, you know. Um, it doesn't matter if it's cart before the horse or the chicken or the egg, it's still there. And I love that that's there implemented, it created such a wonderful grounding rod for people to fly around, or a guy with the hammer can do this and da da and laser, you know, all this sort of stuff. There's a, just a wonderful grounding rod. There's a guy with no superpowers. He's got a stick and a string. He's got a family, right? Just, there was, that said a lot to me about where the set and intention where that character's going. And ultimately to where we're at now with the series is kind of hovering around is no different than that basic principle. You know, stick and a string, a family, and it's Christmas. Honey, I'm home. Hi, company. Sorry, didn't call ahead. This is an agent of some kind. Gentlemen, this is Laura. I know all your names. <laughs> Ooh, incoming. <gasps> Hi, sweetheart. Hey, buddy. How you guys doing? These are Look at your face. smaller agents. What's the filmmaking process like when you do a film of this scale, when you film of this scale? Yeah, I mean, it's just, well, it's just different, right? You, you really want to see, I, I know what Rim River is going to look like when it's done. I have no idea what the film is going to look like in the Marvel Universe. I have zero clue. I mean, no, I know the scenes we shot when it's inside of a lab or something, but like when you don't know what the backdrop is or like what the Hulk really looks like or all, it's just, it's completely different, um, but you know, the, how it, what I don't know what it's gonna look like, you know, I just don't know. But the process of shooting it, some things inform you, like you just focus on what you do know and don't worry about the things you don't know or learn about the things you don't know, you know? It, you, you just gotta do what you gotta do. There's a lot of stunts also, so, and you're wearing the most inappropriate clothes to do the stunts, you know? <laughs> it's all that stuff, but you know, you, you just you, you do the best you can with the with the limitations and um, and, and move forward. The assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford. They say that one of the greatest scenes from a cinematography perspective is the scene where the train arrives and you guys do the heist. <laughs> yeah. So what was it like filming that? Because I know that you were only lit by lanterns and the actual train. <laughs> and we had bags on our heads. So like, what are we doing out here freezing? I could be anybody. I could be James Vanderbeek. No one will know. I was with Sam Rockwell and Sam Shepard and we're sitting in the woods and it's freezing. It's like four in the morning. I think, um, I think Brad Pitt's like on, with the lantern or something on the thing, trying to slow the train down, wherever the heck it was. I remember this very specifically. <laughs> we're all sitting there and we're freezing and we're tired. And we get, like Rockwell's got his, he's got a couple eye holes and one's like, you can only see out like one eye hole. And we're just laughing at each other because we, we didn't know what's going on. And these burlap sacks are on our heads, right? And we're waiting to go rush this train uh, to, to rob it. And, and I don't know if we ever got to it even that night. I remember all of a sudden, Sam Shepard just took off. He's like, you know, forget this, I'm out of here. This is bullshit. <laughs> and he just left. And Rockwell took the thing off. He's like, dude, Renner, I think Shepard just took off. I'm like, ah, I guess, man. It's kind of gangster, but like, what are we doing here? <laughs> We're off camera with bags on our head, freezing our asses off. He's like, should we go too? He's like, yeah, I think we should <laughs> to get out of here. We're never going to get this shot. Um, eventually, somehow, some way, we did get the shot.
I grew up, you know, um, definitely riding horses and being in the countryside and, uh, as part of my life, and it's something I wanted to explore. Something that was really great about that movie, we had beautiful, beautiful horses that are, are disposed at all times to just go out and ride. And it was awesome, and that was our job, you know, in prep for the show. I went out and rode a lot, and that was just, you know, it's a great, great opportunity to, to go do that, you know. There wasn't a lot of, of meat on the bone for me to, to do a whole lot in the picture. It was a certain sort of you know, chess piece in that picture. There's a lot of time spent there. I mean, I feel like I could have shot all my shit out in a, you know, a week, yeah. you know, but you know, six months, you know, I just became a really good writer, you know. Arrival. There's sometimes you watch a film and you kind of sit with yourself afterwards because it's like, it's kind of like really, it's triggered something within you, right? Mm -hmm. One of those films for me was Arrival. Ah, that's, that's funny when you said that. It's just such a beautiful film. Yeah. Do you feel the same way? After yeah, that? yeah, yeah. Because I don't really watch uh, this, anything I do except for maybe like a early cut of something or that. But it's exactly the feeling I got when I saw that. Didn't know much what was going to happen in terms of it was a very, very sparse film. And uh, the character I, it was, was limited in the sense of what we could tell in the story because it's, it's such a rug pull. When I saw that, I remember exactly where I saw it. I remember exactly what happened to me. I had to sit and be like, God damn. I mean, I mean, that's, I said, that's a fucking filmmaker. And I walked out and I started weeping in the parking lot. I was just like so thrown back by what he was able to put together. Cause there's some CG, there's a lot of stuff that I wouldn't understand or know what the film to look like and how it would actually come together. So seeing that, wow, that's a filmmaker. That film doesn't really have a lot of, of, um, of green screen, really? ultimately. Yeah, because anytime there was like a real big effect where the, the big pod, you know, alien pods were there, that was in the big giant fields and they would just be able to place that because it's such a giant landscape, you know, there's no green screen that big. It was a huge, huge area. Now, when it came to inside and climbing up, I mean, there was a whole set built for you know the whole walk up and all that stuff, so it's this whole set, so I didn't have to imagine too much. Except you know the, the the screen was like a big screen. We'd have to look at like X's. We're not seeing the actual aliens dancing around. They did have actually puppeteers with long poles to just to create movement for our eye line that would move around if they're coming in and out of those those foggy shadows, yeah. right? It, that was nice because it was interactive because there was a kind of a puppeteer to, that we could both follow with our eye lines. What we do for a living, sometimes the, the person's not even there when we have to have a scene with them, or it's a tennis ball, or it's a green screen, or it's a, you're there, but you're supposed to be the Hulk. So what are we gonna call them? I don't know. I was thinking Abbott and Costello. American Hustle. That's a very uh, different departure and also with a very different kind of filmmaker. Tremendous cast. You're shooting a movie that's lit for 360 shooting, so it's not, it's not any t typical kind of filmmaking. I, I remember running from the camera a lot because it's just, I mean, I literally I ran off set and I went to the bathroom just so I could just get off camera and stop, you know, performing because you just never know when you're on camera. You just, just always got to be in it at all times and start making up lines. And I was in a character, you know, playing a politician and I only had so much <laughs> that I could sort of like, you know, do that's not written or scripted and I had to sort of like, you know, riff on. He's going to grow our tax base and create thousands and thousands of jobs for everyone. You understand that? You know what that means? Durbin. Durbin. Come on, this guy right here, he's got a big heart. Just hate it if it didn't work out. What do you mean? Of course it's gonna work out. Come on, guys like you and me. Come on, man. Right? We dream and we build. We never give up. We never quit. After like 10 minutes of riffing, I'm like, okay, I'm out. I'm tapped out. I got nothing left to say. <laughs> I just really would go off and just walk off set. And they'd follow me with the camera into the bathroom. I'll go back. I'm like, dude, we're at craft services. You can't film me here. I mean, it was like just so crazy. 
but there's something very kinetic about that style of filmmaking and very alive, um, which is fun. And, and David Russell, he just has such a big heart and smartness to, to what he does. And it's always very character driven. Great characters and a ton of great actors and, and a great director. And, you know, it was, uh, it was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. The Born Legacy. Yeah, I was a fan of those films and getting the opportunity to, to do that, you know, it's, it's kind of the opposite of like Marvel or those kind of action films because it's all very real. It, that it still felt like shooting Born Legacy, like it was a small little independent film. There was only a few, it was me and Rachel Weiss and, or it's just me, or it's just, you know, one dude or three dudes I beat up and then move on. It's a, it's a very small sort of feeling, it's, except for a few big action set pieces, but it's very, you know, close kind of filming. Not like, you know, trying to grab big vistas. You know, it's very, very, very boots on the ground, very, very in your face type of filmmaking. I love that, that process because it just, you know, we can move fast, we can get things done, and you don't want to hurry up and wait. We just hurry up and get it done, and we just kept moving because there's not a lot of things we had to worry about. It's just about me running across this wire. Okay, do I have the wire hooked up here? Da 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 da. Do all these things. Was, you've got to learn all those amazing things. I was already prepared because of my experience, like with Tom Cruise, and teaching me understanding. You know, it is a is a different part of the job, but a very very thing you take serious and a lot of training, eight hours a day for five months, and <laughs> it's a lot of, a lot of work. That was a wonder. Um, so I had a, just a three-story building coming from a basement. It had a parkour up, the thing, get, thing go up. Yeah, it was a whole thing. Did that 18 times. And I did have, I had a harness on with a small pick in case I got tired to, you know, one of the times, because it's got to be all fluid and it all had to be like with the camera, all, all a wonder, right? Ended up using the second take. But I was like, ah, I feel like I could do it better. But, but I did like 18 times and it was exhausting. But, but it was because it was all a one or so many things were variables with the camera movement and the thing and me movement and making sure it was all in focus and come in the thing and then shoot the guy down at the bottom of the stairs, right? It's a very specific thing. But, you know, it was a fun thing to communicate with camera guy and the guy on the wire and the thing to all make it work. But um, they used the second take, you know, but whatever, that's my job. I'm the one that kept asking for another take anyway, so. <laughs> Yeah, he's a ratchet, um, and sometimes it's just a couple of guys yanking on you, and uh, enough to pull. They may have done one if it's a longer, wide shot. They may have used one where they, they'll use an actual like machine or some sort of compression thing with a, to tip for a big yank. The water in, in that scene that you cannot fake. That was like below freezing water. That was brutal. Just coming out of the water, and by the time I got to the edge, there's icicles that formed on my beard. Before I got out of that water, it was crazy. And it Oh, yeah. And again, that's where it's like another one or waiting for the helicopter shot, getting out of the water and the whole thing. And it's like, all right, let's do another one but while I'm still ready and freezing to go again, you know? It was, uh, it was pretty cool. A lot of challenges for that kind of stuff. Wind River. You know, the big impetus for, for Taylor to write Wind River. I mean, because it's about two tribes on, at Wind River and this is one specific thing but it's something that happens often. That's the, the big kind of umbrella theme and something that a lot of people don't know and creating some light on, on that. But there's not a lot of policing, it's not a thing that's a cultural thing that happens and it's tragic, it's all hell, right? But then we still have to tell our story. And this is a character that, unlike Dahmer, was very, very close to me. I live in that kind of environment. I, everything about that guy is very, very similar to me you know, in, in physical ways, in, in, in probably more moral ways, um, very, very close, right? And then you're talking about, you know, death of, of young girls and that type of thing. And then also Corey, you know, like the character I played, lost his child. It was pretty, it was pretty intense. It was, it was a lot, it was a lot to, to handle. And it was good that the character held a lot close to his vest, you know, it was a, just a man of action. And, not a lot of words, and, and it's nice to have Lizzie, you know, someone that I was comfortable with already in the, and that just in the acting world, and she's terrific. But it was it was a very difficult uh, time. If you can make to that highway, you're a free man. 
Where, where's, where, where's the highway? You know how far that drug camp was from where I found Natalie's body? Mm -hmm. Six miles. Barefoot. That's a warrior. That's a warrior. You, you made me 600 feet. I think we're about 12,000 feet elevation. That was beautiful, beautiful vista. But yeah, we had to be kind of harnessed in for a lot, just for the safety of, we had very little places to shoot up there. And it was a big, big scene, you know? Actually, that actor's in, where I'm working, worked with for Mayor of Kingstown, that same actor. It's funny, I just, we just spoke together about that scene recently. So funny, it's fresh in my brain. Mayor of Kingstown. How was Ed? Oh. Tim Weaver's nephew got hooked. Mailed a letter. Some low level crap, don't know if it's sanctioned. Yeah, that's a, a, a departure from what uh, Taylor's written in the past, where it's, it's usually more rural and, um, you know, cowboy or just kind of, kind of with the land. This is in a very more urban prison town. But what Taylor always does is he writes very truthful, raw. You know, it's not always pleasant, and that's where it's very truthful. Um, it's very poetic, it's very tender, as it is violent. So that can be expected. Um, but it's just now set in a prison town where the business of incarceration is the only business. And I play a character called the mayor, the mayor Mike McCluskey, who is the grease uh, that uh, lubricates the whole engine of that, that prison town and in the process of it for the, from the prisoners to the, to the guards to the all, all around in and out of that town. He's a good guy. He can do bad shit to you, though. <laughs> yeah, he'll do, he'll do whatever it takes to keep the peace. Yeah, he, what he, he's yeah, he's he's not a bad guy at all. He's pretty a self, a very selfless guy, which is pretty admirable, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Is, yeah, 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 me too. Yeah. <laughs>